to let anyone else know about it. Uh, so I'm pleased to welcome Sue Spade. Uh, Sue has been, uh, since the mid-80s, she's been working uh, involved in artists as a collector, curator, art writer, and art educator. And she recently completed a PhD in philosophy at Temple University, where her dissertation was titled <coughs> Work and World on the Philosophy of Curatorial Practice. Her gallery, Sue Spade Fine Art, opened in Los Angeles and ran from 1990 to 95 and maintained an artist ratio quite deliberately uh, and innovatively for the time, comprised of 50% men and 50% women artists. Soon after closing her gallery in 95, she began curating exhibitions for museums and has curated, since then, curated well over 100 exhibitions for institutions and alternative sites and has written extensively on contemporary art. She is the <coughs> author of five exhibition accompanying books, three of which concern practical art. Uh, those three are titled Ecovention, Current Art to Transform Ecologies. The second one, A Field Guide to Patricia Johansson's Work, Built, Proposed, Published, and Collected. And the third one, Green Acres, Artists Farming Fields, Greenhouses, and Abandoned Lots. So please join me in welcome us to speak. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you, Golston College, for coming out today. Um, for me, it feels warm for London, but maybe I'm wrong. I think it's seasonally warm, so I feel very lucky. Um, anyway, a little drizzly, but that's to be expected, right? Uh, anyway, so um, there's a couple things I want you guys to keep in mind. Sometimes you have people come and they presented their work, and they're really fixed with their views, and they will argue you to the teeth because they don't want to, they can't possibly be wrong and they can't possibly rethink their position. But I don't feel that way. I've written my dissertation and I'm spending some time with it um, to rethink it. And I'm trying to get the stories out in various forms to many different groups of people so I can get feedback. So for me, it's really, it's not a work in progress, but it's open. If you guys can give me some great insight into something I'm missing or I got wrong, you will be a footnote with the credit with accredited contribution. So listen carefully and please feel free then to critique me or ask questions that are impossible to answer. Okay, I don't know if you guys have had the chance to read the Kevin Melchioni essay that Mark had distributed. Some of you, how many of you guys read it? Okay, that's great because I was, I was worried that it might be a total review for some of those of you. If everyone had read it, you might be really bored. But even so, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the article pick it apart, not critique it, but explain all the details. And then I'm going to um, go through my paper and then we're going to end with looking at his, his ideas and how they apply to my idea of curating. Okay? Um, so the, the primary reason that I chose this essay, so Kevin Malcolm is a kind of interesting philosopher. He's a painter. He has a PhD, um, but he doesn't teach at a university. He teaches at a, uh, I guess at a music school, a high school music school. And I don't really know why. I have never met him to ask him why, but I think that's really interesting. So here's a guy who teaches in Connecticut at a high school and writes what I think are some of the best papers in analytic philosophy written by an American. Um, and anyway, so, and he's very skeptical of the whole program in philosophy. So the, one of the reasons this essay um, interested me in the beginning was because, for me, it's the rare bit of philosophy that challenges something called the transparency of the mental. So what's that, the transparency of the mental? I thought this was a great little Joel Spicer um, comic that sort of deals with how impossible it is to know what we're thinking at any particular time. But sort of implicit in philosophy is this view that we always know what we're thinking, we're, that we have a special authority over our thoughts, that we can just sort of, you know, introspect. We can look inside and we know immediately that we prefer pizza to spaghetti, or that we know immediately that this is the best wine we've ever had, or the best chocolate ice cream, or you know, the, all these kind of gut reactions we have. This introspection is that, you know, we we know our feelings, we have access to them, uh, we know we're in love. We all know we've not always known we're in love. So these, these assumptions of introspection are all sort of related. And 
I think it's interesting that psychologists call this introspection, but philosophers call this self-knowledge. It's just a sort of different term for the same kind of activity. And I'm sure that you guys have always heard that Socrates had that famous quote, the unexamined life is not worth living, right? So again, this assumption that we just always know what we're doing, always know why we're doing it, always know where we're going. And I think the one thing that has always been really important to me about the arts is that the arts actually taught me the opposite. Well, between the arts and um, Blaise Pascal, the heart has its reasons that reason cannot know. That's what first turned out philosophy, in fact. Okay, so philosophers presume this self-examination is easy, and artists routinely um, admit to its struggle. No wonder this painted philosopher, I'm talking about Milken, aims to dispose philosophers of this wrong-headed assumption. Their naive beliefs concerning the infallibilism of aesthetic preferences. So Malpini notes that since the 1950s, psychologists have produced a steady stream of empirical evidence in support of what he calls an anti-introspectivist view, meaning that psychologists are routinely doing tests that challenge the fact that we don't really know what we think, that we might say we like this one day, or you might say, I love stout, the next day I love um, IPAs, and someone's like, yeah, last week you loved style. Oh, I don't know, I changed my mind. Or, you know, we just are constantly changing our mind. And, um, and what Melchiona wants to say is that's really normal. Okay, it's normal for us to be changing our mind. And philosophers need to really start, stop believing. And even arts educators, I mean, all, this, all these ideas are predicated on some sort of idea that knowledge is freely accessible, not freely as in terms of money, but easily accessible, readily accessible, and that it can somehow influence our views and that our views are not flip-flopping views. But in fact, all this research is sort of pointing to the fact that we really are flip-floppers. So here's one um, sort of psychological test. You know, when you ask, it turns out when you ask people whether they're happy, 90% of the people report all the time that they're happy. But when you give them some sort of device where they can self-identify all day long, like once an hour, it turns out 30% of the people are really unhappy. So we have a kind of global view of ourselves as happy, but we have a over the you know a sort of more um, not less a global view, but more like one that's happening a moderated view that says that in fact we might not be so happy. <coughs> So then there's also this crazy experiment where they did to people, they said, well, we're going to give you a shot and it's going to help you see better. And so then um, one was a sedative, one was a stimulant. Of course, it had nothing to do with seeing. It had to do with how they would behave. And one was a placebo. And um, somehow 30% of the people you know, laughed crazily if they'd been given the stimulant. 30% of the people sort of seemed like they were totally uninterested. And 37 of the people just probably behaved naturally. But when they asked them to report exactly what they'd experienced, it turned out that, in fact, there was absolutely no relationship between how they behaved and what they felt. And it was more probably, uh, it wasn't at all driven by their behavior. So these are the kinds of experiments that psychiatrists have been doing, or psychologists have been doing with people. So Melchioni sums up, he says that this unawareness can result from either repressed responses, divided attention, automaticity of thought, bias in non-conscious processing, and a lack of awareness or elusive feelings or reactions. I'm sure we've all felt times when we didn't really want to say what we felt, and that would be like a repressed response. It turns out when you distract people, they get really confused, and then they might respond to how they've been distracted, even though they were having another experience. Anyway, I'm at, you know, for whatever reason, I'm very interested in the fact that um, of this gap between what we think we feel and what we actually feel, or what's actually going on inside of our head. Okay, so that's the first reason I'm interested in the article. The second is the number of people, okay, so it's called on the old saw. I don't know anything about art, but I know what I like when I see it. If I had a nickel for everyone who's ever said that to me, I would be really rich. Um, it turns out this is, I mean, for me, I, when I had the gallery for five years, there were so many people that walk, walk into the gallery and they go, oh, this is nothing for me. And I used to look at them like, well, maybe you should do something for it. You know, it didn't seem to me that art is supposed to do something for the viewer. Um, but then, then more people like Dave Hickey, who's a kind of well-known American art critic and writer, he was like, he would always say, I know what I like when I see it. And when he would always say that, that would make me go crazy. 
So when I, you know, when I read the Smell Candy article, and he's sort of disproving the fact that we actually don't know what we like, and we don't know what we, we don't really know what we like when we see it. I was very excited about that. Okay. So then finally, um, this article, this article suggests, or excuse me, requests us to doubt our aesthetic responses, especially to new artworks. He, he talks about something called the affect bias. I think this is really interesting. So the next time you see something and you're not convinced, I mean, we have that expression a lot, like, oh, I'm not convinced, or I don't think they're as good as everyone thinks they are, or um, he says that this affect bias is what happens when you have a certain expectation. You, know, you think, it, and he says it even, um, it even this affect bias applies to when People think that um, this is not a good, this is not good art. So let's say, you know, you think that the artist should be really good at drawing, and it's just a kind of scrawl of, like, for example, I don't know if you know Arno Freiner. Or there's often times, you know, people who make drawings that people are like, oh, they're really childlike. Well, maybe you have a view that artists shouldn't make childlike art. They should make art that's very sophisticated, really well trained. So when you have those kinds of views, you bring along this affect bias. So you. You can't like it because, in fact, it challenges your view of what art should be. He says, we rely on the trappings of conviction to avoid the discomfort of confusion and indifference. For the sake of familiarity, we let our prior taste stand proxy for our current experiences. The very process of coming up with reasons for our responses can confuse us. So these, again, are some more interesting ideas. And here's his final conclusion. By embracing anti-introspectivism, so this is a kind of critique of the fact that we can be introspective, we move more, we move toward a more naturalistic view of taste, with more room for confusion, indifference, and transience in our aesthetic preferences. Even with so much confusion in our cultural lives, there's also far too much success to accept the idea that aesthetic self-knowledge never yields reliable results. So he's not really throwing the whole thing away. He's actually, I mean, as I'll, I'm going to go through some of his terms, he has this idea of biological taste. So he actually thinks that each of us has had a whole slew of experiences and exposures and educations and memories, and each of us has, there's a reason why we do have a taste, and we do have particular tastes. But he's also saying at the same time, a lot of times we defer to that when in fact we might be able to like something that we don't think we like we do, or that we don't think, that we don't know we already like, something like that. Okay, so, I know, it's crazy. So I'm just going to go through these terms because I doubt anyone's ever heard of them before. Um, well, maybe cultivation, okay, so he uses the word cultivation just to talk about the fact that we live in time and each day we're trying these things and we're expanding, we have an expansion of taste to other objects and, you know, we're just, you know, we're drinking more and more beer, we're, um, getting a real taste for which IPA comes from which hops and the Cascade hops and the Citra hops and we can, you know, we're cultivating our taste. We're getting more and more experience um, with the kinds of things that matter to us. Then he talks about, he kind of uses these terms interchangeably, aesthetic self-knowledge, aesthetic satisfaction, aesthetic pleasure. He says a vital aesthetic life is functionally dependent on self-knowledge. Our choices as cultural participants or consumers are underwritten by our beliefs about works of art. I like X because of R. And as you see, as you're going to see, he has he has this really interesting observation that as soon as we try to explain what we like and why we like it, we be, that's when we become confused. When we don't have to explain it, we can be really clear about what we like, and that's when we're most prone to say, "I know what I I like when I see it." But when your friend says, "But why do you like it?" then that's when we get a little confused. Um, Okay, so then he has another concept, the biographical taste, and that's when you're, he says that, that actually biographical taste is a kind of truism, because that's what we're relying on to get a sense of what we like today, that's our kind of proxy, our conviction. And, but he says, the, he says it becomes illogical because, in fact, today's response should build on yesterday's response. And if we know why we liked yesterday's response, then we should also know why we like today. So when we start to get confused um, about our preferences, that's when um, this kind of situation goes into jeopardy. 
Okay, then he has this idea of the illusion of authenticity. Um, he says the cultural experiences are, in, in this case, he's kind of poking fun of the way we experience things, because in fact, we experience things in ways that are tried, that amp up this illusion of authenticity, because in fact, you know, we go to the museum and it's on white walls, and you know, it's, we're focused on the painting or the objects in front of us, or we go, in, we go to the movies and we're just in one movie theater and we're totally focused. So all these activities that have been designed to sort of clear out the distractions that could possibly interfere with your response to what you're experiencing, he said all those are really created to amp up this illusion of authenticity. Um, so he says the paradigm for aesthetic attention supports the notion that we stand before our experience commanding our observation with refinement and precision. <laughs> and then finally, this notion of, a, he calls it aesthetic exceptionalism. exceptionalism. If you've read John Dewey, and you've, or The Art as Experience, which is a really great book, if you're looking for an interesting historical book to read, um, he says the way that Dewey describes experience is like the aesthetic experience. It's like, for most philosophers of art, aesthetic experience is always conscience. In fact, experience is conscience. You can't have an experience, this is by definition, not really, I mean, obviously we could argue with the philosophers, but they, they tend to think of experience as, as being conscious. So if we have this view of aesthetic unreliability, that puts into jeopardy the concept of an aesthetic experience. And so then he asks the question, are aesthetic experiences exceptional in that respect? Okay, so um, so here's some more terms. I promise in five minutes we'll have all the terms under our belts. So we'll be able to go forward. Okay, so then he wants to give three examples of what he calls emotion unawareness. And this is some sort of disconnect between, again, what we feel, why we feel it, how we know what we feel, and things that sort of give cause to this problem that he's identified. So the first one is you have some sort of aesthetic response, but you're not even aware of it. And here's an example of someone telling another person, you know, you really don't like to do the dishes. No, no, I don't mind, I don't mind, I like to do the dishes. But the way they're behaving, throwing the dishes around and being, acting all grumpy is suggesting that maybe the person doesn't really like to do the dishes. So then he also talks about people who are maybe gonna jump out of an airplane and they don't even notice it, but their knees are like rattling back and forth. And they'll be like, no, no, I really wanna do this, I really wanna do this, I've always wanted to do this. So he's talking about these, you know, we put up these denials, we put up these, um, and in fact, we probably do know that we have to often, in order to do something that takes courage, we have to deny that. But he, he's saying there seems to be some sort of gap between how we're behaving and what we think we want to do or what we think we would like. He says our biographical conception of taste becomes a top-down director, or worse, a spokesman, a spokesperson or spin master translating our inchoate responses into a coherent story of an aesthetic personality. So that's the first one. So like I said, aesthetic response is totally out of line with our awareness of what we're, how we're acting and what we think. Um, the second one he calls the aesthetic response has an inord, inaccurate second order awareness. So when you're asked, you give a totally wrong explanation. So the individual doesn't know that the state is an effective state. So this is the example of the affect bias. So he gives a funny story about a guy who's a full sign, he goes on a date with a girl who's in art school, and they go to see an exhibition, and it just so happens it's a Pilate Reist, big, giant video. And even though like the pictures are really pretty, and it's, the music is really fun, and he thinks, wow, this is nice, he thinks, I really shouldn't like this. This is a little too pleasant. This isn't hardcore enough. You know, so the, the guy, the Philistine, rejects it because he doesn't think it's like serious art, right? That's the example he gives. Um, but basically, in a, in a nutshell, it's when you inaccurately report feelings that are actually true. So you deny them, but you actually really feel them. So the guy says, the bloody beast is crap, but he actually really likes it, okay? So the, second, the third one is the false attribution of the case of, I feel bad that Pilates is now the, the case for art that's crap, but, and you really like, but that's how it is in this story. Um, so the third is the false attribution of the cause of aesthetic response. 
And he gives a very funny example. Apparently they did these tests again. I, these psychologists all sound a little sadistic to me. Uh, so this is the love on a bridge test. So you have this really crazy bridge that's totally scary to walk across. You have these guys walking across the bridge thinking they're going to fall into the river. And they're met with a very pretty girl on the other side. And they always act like they're unafraid. So somehow this girl, this pretty girl, oh, the, the pretty girl gives the guy the phone. The, her phone number says, call me sometime. So apparently, if, if the guy has just walked across the bridge that he thinks he's going to die, he's more likely to phone her than if he's walked across the bridge where he feels secure. I know, it's a weird test. But apparently, um, that test has identified the fact that they're not really reacting to the girl. They're reacting to their fears, right? Anyway, I don't know. OK, so then he there's another example of people being asked to explain which jams they prefer, which you know, jam, strawberry jam they prefer. And that when they don't, this is really interesting to me, when they don't discuss it, they always agree with the expert. But the more they start to discuss it, the more they diverge. And this, in a nutshell, would be why I think the public spectators, the public matters. Because if you don't really challenge the exhibition you've seen, and you don't really deny it or say they forgot all the right pieces or their claims don't hold water, then in fact you're deferring to the expert. But if you start to say, oh, well, you know, the show was interesting until it fell apart, or, you know, when you start to challenge it, you start to discuss it, that's when your views start to diverge from the experts. So in a nutshell, when we ask for reasons for our feelings, whatever comes to mind as a possible response carries greater weight simply because it emerged during a reason-seeking process. Reasons for liking Cezanne. He says, that, you know, you say, oh, I love Cezanne, or I love that painting. It could very well be the only reason you love that painting is because 20 years ago in art history, it was one of the paintings your teacher used as the example. Or, you know, he says, how do we really know we love it? You know, these are the questions. He says, more often than we suppose, it is extremely difficult, though perhaps not impossible, <coughs> to answer this question about, you know, why do we love something? What, why, do, why do we have these feelings? Our reports of our conscious experience, including our responses to works of art, are quite possibly incorrect. Okay. So, um, so much, in, so this is how it relates to um, my paper. Much interpersonal interaction with <coughs> culture involves the sharing of our responses and the attribution of those responses to qualities that works of art really have. The most mundane studio banner and the most sophisticated art criticism both rely on accurate attribution. When we feel compelled to give reasons for our responses to works of art, it is assumed that we are examining and reporting on our mental states. That is, our responses, oh, and mental states are things like, I desire this, I believe this, I think this. That is, our responses to works of art or other occasions for aesthetic experience. Ignorance about why we feel as we do sometimes leads us to invent or speculate about the causes of our feelings. We substitute for successful introspection some other belief about the work, a theory from our criticism, an anecdote about the artist, a cliche. Or we may rely on how a friend, colleague, or critic responds, modeling our beliefs about our feelings on what we think their feelings might be. So this again, this deference, we might you know, someone says, do you like it? Well, you go, yes. Why do you like it? Well, you think of what your friend told you yesterday. So none of these are crimes. He's not saying, oh, you should never defer to your friends. He should, he's never saying, never talk about it because that will distort your feelings. He's not saying, um, he's just putting it out there. Let's, what, what, what is the problem for philosophy if, in fact, people are really not capable of understanding so well? And, in fact, maybe the real challenge to all of us is to really think more deeply about what we think about things. Okay. So, Mal so Malpioni's essay should give you a little confidence um, that since people don't know what they like, there's no good reason to curate to some common denominator. And I think that's really, to me, the takeaway, is that oftentimes, you know, you have an idea for a show, either as an artist or a curator, and people are like, oh, no one's going to get that, or that's too esoteric. But maybe, in fact, if in fact there's already this gap between how people will respond and um, what they think they're responding, maybe in fact that's a kind of little 
um, a push to go for your own gut feeling, to, to work with the, with the material as you like it. That said, one must also be prepared both to anticipate and accommodate this response. Even if you've already read the essay and you know in your heart that people who say these kinds of things don't really know what they're saying. You have to take their claims as, at face value. You can't just say to people, oh, you don't know what you think or, because I read this essay and people don't know what they think. You have to know that, they, that, okay, they may not know what they think, but you can't really confront them with that. You have to be prepared for, what, for the fact that they will say that they know what they like when they see it. Okay. Um, okay, so where are we? You have to take the claims at face value while hoping that your efforts, which are hugely collaborative, as well as others, eventually work on them over time, enabling them to develop new values, beliefs, ideas, and interests. Most art worlds think people need to know more, and maybe this is partly true, but the question is, how do they access the information that they need? So now I'm going to try to make a case for curating. Um, and I want to be clear, when I talk about curators, I don't mean um, artists who organize their exhibitions are curators. So I'm not talking about someone who works in an institution. I'm talking about the practice of, of imagining how people will experience your work, how you select the works that you want to show, how you arrange it, and how you envision people having that experience. So that's what I, when I refer to a curator, I, that's, it's a general term for that kind of activity. Okay. So for me, um, the curatorial, pro I'm just trying to make a, um, it's a five-step process um, between an exhibition and the people finally maybe accepting some of the views of this exhibition. So for me, it starts out with this, this curator, whether an artist, a gallerist, whoever, organizes this exhibition. I call it exacting because I feel like um, a lot goes into it. You have to select the works that go together. You have to imagine where to, how to position them how they're playing off of each other, um, how the spectator will circulate around the space. So then you have in mind certain hypotheses. It could be really as simple as, this is the best artist in the world, then you have to prove that. Or it's um, as less simple as, um, this artist has a new painting technique that we don't know about, or that people don't know about, but we're gonna show you what their new technique is, or, you know. So anyway, so there's some hypothesis testing that's going on. Um, and for me, the narrative threats are what your spectator is inferring. So even if you write everything very clearly, like yesterday, or the last couple of days we were at Tate Britain and Tate Modern, where they have phenomenal um, didactic panels, as you all know, object labels, didactic. When you, for me, when you create an exhibition, it doesn't matter what you wrote, you have to show that in the exhibition with the works, because people infer things from the works on view more than they do from the panels. And especially if you've, heard, if you've heard the statistic that only 7% of people read panels, then you know how important the objects are, right? So then institutional memories is when you're, you've left the show, you're discussing the show with other people, and everyone's trying to figure out what's going on and how it, you know, what was happening in that show. And I think the curator meant this, and I think the artist meant this. Or, you know, you're, you're debating what the takeaway message of the exhibition was, or what the import of the exhibition was. And finally, at some point, you know, <coughs> institutional memories settle, and there's some sort of common knowledge that comes into being. Okay. So, as briefly discussed, when people are asked to give reasons for their preferences, they sometimes get confused. <coughs> and their preferences change as they reflect upon their reasons. Apparently, in situations where aesthetic experience is accompanied by debate and discussion, the reliability of our knowledge of the experience de decreases, calling into question the very discourse that is generated by the work of art. For this reason, critical discourse may be less reliable as a guide to our experiences than we have supposed. So that's kind of interesting. So you have these people that have gone to the exhibition, now they're chatting about what they saw, they're talking about the reviews that they wrote, and the critic didn't know what he was talking about, and the curator didn't know what she or he were talking about, and the artist doesn't, you know, everyone, the spectators all have their views of what was going on, and, um, and they're critiquing anything, but what's interesting to me is that all, as soon as we start to chat about this, um, that's when all of this starts to get um, thrown into question. So it's not that it's not good to, chat about it, but that um, that's when some of the problems start to begin. So this is what um, Malcione 
describes is the fallibility of reason. So when we start to give our reasons, that's when we start to question ourselves. So I like jam number one, no, I like jam number two. The more we discuss it, the more, oh, you're right. It does have that lovely note of, I don't know, fresh strawberry or maize strawberry or something. Then, oh, you're right, I do, I think I like that better. So despite the fallibility of reasons, Melchioni still considers art goers reason shoppers, since they're not only searching for good reasons, but they're just as appreciative of good reasons for believing as they are for the objects under consideration. In fact, one would say that every art world institution, from museums to publications and schools, are either in the business of offering artists or teaching students how to produce effective reasons for believing. Right? That's why we have crits and we ask you questions and you try to explain what you're doing because reasons matter. <coughs> By proposing hypotheses coupled with related tools for interpretation, curated exhibitions <laughs> facilitate each viewer's capacity to grasp each artwork's significance. By conveying contexts and availing concepts, exhibitions play the greatest role in lending exhibited objects, whether artworks or artificial, artifactual souvenirs, their respective contents. Um, you may disagree with this, but that's just, um, that's something we can discuss afterwards. But I'm, I'm really at this moment just contrasting an exhibition with a book, not an art object itself. Okay, so, oh, wrong button. So I don't know how this shows up. This is a show from 1969. Some of you who went to Venice this summer might have seen the remake of the Harold Samon show um, when attitudes became formed. But this was a show that was at the Whitney around like a month later. The same artists, Keith Sarnier, Raphael Ferrer, Bruce Nelm, and Eva Hess. I mean, not the totally same list, but a very similar show. But it was the first show in the States that introduced these kinds of materials where you know, latex, wood, non-art, let's just call it in general non-art non -art materials. Of course, it's not non-art materials in 2013, but in 1969, it sort of blew the brain, blew the brain. So it made people go crazy in New York City. They didn't know what they were looking at, and they had no idea why this was art. But anyway, so the reason I, I use this slide instead of Harold Zaman show is because I, I'm actually quoting Marsha Tucker. Okay, so she says that, um, Marsha Tucker recalls the period in the early 1970s following anti-illusion procedural materials when artists began using non-art materials such as logs, rope, belt, latex paint to produce large sculptures. The more dealers chose to exhibit these unusual materials, the more articles were written and published, arguments were generated by individual artists, and group shows were staged. Yet this new idiom hadn't penetrated the bastions of the museum world. So this is kind of interesting. So she does this show. People, all the board trustees are having a problem with it. Why are you showing this? This isn't art. People coming to the museum are stomping out. You know, lots of ruckus is taking place. And as you know, the Harold Simon show had the same issue in Bern. Um, yet, ironically, the introduction of the show and the discussion that follows is what, in fact, makes it possible. So the people come to the show, I don't like art made out of latex, I don't like art made out of neon, I don't like art made out of resin, but resin, they're not used to it, so they can dismiss it, but eventually something happens that changes all of their minds because now I don't you know I don't think anyone has problems with these issues anymore. Well maybe someone does, but okay, so I suggest that exhibitions lend objects their contents because exhibitions are ephemeral some contents expire, and while others prove untenable. So in this case, the content is this sort of anti-illusion, right? I'm going to, we're going to give you honest, un, um, you know, honest materials. You know, real logs, real rope, real felt. Nothing will be illusional. In other words, exhibitions propose reasons for believing, however temporarily. That this exhibition presents the best way to frame the artworks on view. Um, it's interesting. I'm work, working on an essay or on, a, on a, um, a paper for two weeks to give a presentation in Holland. And looking at the same works of art, I realized I could give 15 separate papers. And that's kind of an interesting moment when you take a subset of an artist's work and you realize that you could focus, you could give 15 totally different um, papers just based on the same body of work. But I, I'm just saying this because I'm sure that, you know, in retrospect, you know, this was originally framed as anti-illusion, but maybe some of you could come up with 
again, 15 different ways to exhibit this work and to look at it and to make it really come alive in ways, you know, that back then the only way that seemed logical was to deal with it in terms of anti-illusion or the real. Okay, being a collaborative, um, being a collaborative process, exhibitions rely heavily on public perception. So an artwork's meaning is no more attributable to some curator's exhibition than an artist's intention. So but with, that, with this I mean that just because the curators called it anti-illusion, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's like the only way to look at it for the all of eternity. The best curators work on behalf of artists, but the path leading to an exhibition is full of compromises and constraints, especially since curators must satisfy their employers as much as their audience, which includes critics. Exhibitions succeed when appreciative spectators and critics alike spread the word, leaving each artist satisfied by his or her artwork's most recent performance, but also wondering under what context future curators will present his or her artworks. The, the content of post-exhibition chatter indicates which of the curators' hypotheses were accepted, overlooked, or dismissed. Okay, so now I have this really bizarre chart. But anyway, but I'm going to explain it to you. So basically, I have this view that um, you know a lot of times exhibitions get redone. So we've now, in in my lifetime, we've had four Magritte exhibitions. I, I think I only talk about no, there's all four up there. So we have Moma '65, the Hayward Gallery in '92, Lacma '2007, and now Moma again in 2013. And um, what's interesting to me is that all these shows, even though maybe they have overlap of works. I'm sure that every one of them has, for example, The Treachery of Images, that's a Cecilia Peasant Peep. Um, even though they might have overlapping artworks, curators are generally going to try to come up with a different thesis that, than their predecessors. They don't just redo the show. Well, that's not totally true, but in general, they try not to redo the show. They try to have an innovative spin. And when I look at the material, for example, for the 92 show at MoMA, which, well, it was at the Hayward and then it traveled to the Met, it seemed like that show was focused on the symbolism in Magritte's work. Whereas if you have a chance to see the show that's, I didn't see the show at LA County in 2007, but if you have a, if you look at the show um, that's at, at MoMA in 2013, the focus is really interesting because it seems to be, it's sort of like, basically Magritte knew what Saussure knew in that when Saussure dies in 1913 and in 1916 is published, um, his book about a course in general linguistics, which you might have studied, the ideas, the basic idea is that um, the relationship between meaning and the sign is arbitrary. So when Magritte puts, um, you know, he has a, a cloud and he puts a picture, I can't remember, I should have a Magritte painting for this, but I mean, he, he has one word and then he has a different picture. So he's playing with this idea of the arbitrariness between um, signs and pictures. So anyway, the point I'm trying to make with this crazy graph is that there's going to be ideas that the curator in 1965 introduced at MoMA, and some of those ideas are going to last until 2013, and some of them are going to be disproven by you know, either the 92 show or the 2007 show. So the, so the point is, is that you know, the curator makes this exhibition, the public goes to see it, the public discusses it, they infer different narratives, some of the narratives become institutional theories. Some of the narratives are just forgotten. Some of the institutional theories are later disproven. Some of them are remembered. Some of them are forgotten. So you have this kind of time-based process of an exhibition where it, it generates ideas, but not all the ideas last. And this is really an important um, insight or aspect of my work because I feel like, for whatever reason, when philosophers go to exhibitions and they read the didactic panels, they think that whatever they read about the exhibition has always been true of that artwork. And then when I explain to them, go like, oh no, the didactic panels are rewritten for every exhibition. That freaks them out because they want to believe that in fact there's only one meaning to each artwork and it's kind of frozen on that panel. Okay, and then as a flip to you guys as artists whose works are borrowed, you know, you can know that if you read something about your work and you think it's absurd, It'll probably be different in the next show. Okay. So, but the point being that um, that whatever narrative threads become institutional memories, some are remembered and are proved very useful, 
most have forgotten and never make it to our history, and then other them, others of them are um, disproved. Okay, so although exhibitions are meant to inspire audiences to weave narrative threads, most related thoughts vanish into thin air soon after exhibited works are returned to their rightful owners. All that remains once an exhibition ends are those narrative threads that survive as institutional memories and thus influence the art world's understanding of particular artworks. By the time some second exhibition, I'm calling it Exhibition Y, occurs at time TM, all that remains of the first exhibition are the institutional memories, that those that have become convention. Since the institutional memories that have been disproved, some have been disproved and some have been forgotten. So curated exhibitions leave a trail in the form of favorable or unfavorable institutional memories. And I think that's kind of something that's, again, interesting about exhibitions that you can't say about any other, like you can't say really about theater. So theater, a theater piece might be only have 20 performances, but at least it has a score, or a script, I mean, that you can refer to. You may not, or it can be videotaped. But there's something about exhibitions that are more ephemeral than, um, than either theater or movies or even a rock concert, especially these days with YouTube. I mean, I, have never, I haven't heard yet of anyone putting an exhibition on YouTube or ha it having a life like that. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't know that. Okay, given Melchior's findings, it's unsurprising that radical exhibitions leave unfavorable immediate impressions. So I'm giving as an example, um, you know, the anti-illusion show or other shows where people have thought they didn't like them because it's, we're not really attuned to, to responding positively to something that's so unfamiliar. But eventually these kinds of rejections morph into favorable overall impressions when artists, curators, and historians return to the materials years later to study it in greater depth. When artworks reappear in new exhibitions, memories are sometimes restored. I mean, have you ever had the experience that you're seeing something again and you're like, you, you realize you memorized it or remembered it totally differently than it was. Um, or you focus on some other aspect of it. You didn't really know, you focus on a new aspect that you're like, oh, I didn't really realize, or I didn't notice this before, even though you know it's the same artwork, but now you're being asked to look at it differently. As one can imagine, exhibitions on their own cannot persuade audiences to transform reasons into beliefs. As already noted, spectators readily change their minds and become confused when asked to explain their preferences. Curated exhibitions offer viewers first-hand experiences that encourage them to reflect upon the ways in which the curator's efforts conceptualize the artworks on view. After years of deliberation and either repeat museum visits or experiences with related exhibitions, spectators eventually feel prepared to formulate and share their own beliefs regarding the artworks in question, which are most likely no longer in view. Okay, so I'm gonna switch. Um, so just for fun, I have two, these two philosophers' pictures just to give you a sense of time. One guy's from the 19th century, one guy's still living. And in fact, one guy's a very famous British philosopher, but um, is not very well loved in Britain. But I actually really think, I think his book, Art and the Imagination, is really great, but most people know him as a horrible fascist, so they don't really like him. And that's Roger Scruton, not God like Very good. Okay, so as acts of the imagination, unrealized exhibitions that never materialize beyond the proposal stage and remain stored in the curator's imagination are what Roger Scruton calls unasserted. And I would, it's, I would totally extend that to you guys who ever want to do an art project, and you're like, I really want to do this, and you never really get around to doing it. So it's a, sort of the same thing. It remains unasserted, right? It's just in your imagination as something that you want to do. Since one entertains P as a possibility, but doesn't get to do it. But as demonstrations, so an unrealized exhibition is a, is a possibility, but a realized one is a demonstration. So as demonstrations, realized exhibitions offer what Scruton terms publicly, over, publicly observable states of affairs. So, so this is what I'm going to argue makes um, exhibitions really interesting. is because, in fact, people can come and see them. It gives you something concrete to talk about. 
if you misinterpret what you see or if your reasons are incorrect, you can go back and look at it or you can take a photo. You have some proof of what you're feeling. It's not just simply a reaction. In lieu of exhibitions, curators wearing their art historian hats sometimes conduct first-hand research with artworks and publish essays that introduce and defend their phenomenological found findings or organize symposiums that urge larger public discussions of some artists' oeuvre or particular artistic themes. But what I would argue that those are always secondhand, right? They're not the same as exhibitions. If you go to a talk and someone shows you slides, they can pretty much tell you anything they want about the artwork, which is very different than if you have the artworks in front of you to sort of judge whether what they're asking you to think or to, well, to imagine, not to think. But they're asking you to um, understand as their hypothesis, you can doubt what they're thinking, what they're offering you. What exhibitions offer over essays and symposiums is that they yield demonstrations of curators' hypotheses that can be verified as true or not, or at least useful as plausible handy theories. Without an exhibition, hypotheses, hypotheses are sometimes introspective and or solipsistic, lacking the exhibition's empirical imprimatur. Those readers, listeners who have not explored the artworks under discussion cannot judge either the merits or the accuracy of written spoken clinics. One might worry that art history texts and exhibition catalogs which do transmit secondhand observations generate knowledge in the form of privatized states of affairs. So that's kind of the opposite of the public, right? Because it's not publicly accessible. So long as art historical knowledge joins other publicly observable states of affairs, readers and spectators are justified in discussing and analyzing artworks described in publications. Reviews and articles thus critically affirm spectators' beliefs. As it turns out, realized exhibitions are no less un unasserted thoughts than their unrealized counterpoints still floating in the curator's imagination. So even though the public exhibition is a demonstration, in a, in a strange way, it's not that much stronger because it's fleeting. So the fact that they last only three months, all of your, everything is gonna be dependent on your memory, which sort of makes it not that assertive. It's, it's almost, well, it's, it's a demonstration, so it's not a possibility, but it's not as strong as, as an assertion. The fleeting nature of temporary exhibitions leaves them no less imaginary than imagined exhibitions. In fact, Francis Haskell titled his book The Ephemeral Museum to emphasize the significance of exhibitions' temporariness, their fleeting nature, a point that distinguishes exhibitions from aesthetic experiences such as theater, film, and performances, which are either presented over and over, even if staged, directed, acted, and received differently with each performance, or recorded for pos posterity like film or an MP3. But one of Haskell's primary claims concerns the way the ephemerality associated with temporary exhibitions results in this heightened emotion and intensity. So you know it's only gonna be there for two months, so you're much more inclined to go, and when you go, you're gonna be really focused and trying to get as much out of it as possible because it's the last time you're ever gonna see this painting or this installation or this video. So you, it has a kind of heightened intensity that something that you know you could see over and over and over doesn't have. He says, the heightened emotion and intensity of observation that come from an awareness that their experience of magic can only be short-lived. And he was inspired by the fact that, I don't know if you've heard this funny story, but apparently um, Marcel Proust was on his deathbed. Well, he, he, he died a couple weeks later, but he was very, very sick. But he, excuse me, was dying to see the Vermeer show, the, the, the show de Palm. So he awoke from his sickness and went straight to the show de Palm to see the, um, the Vermeer exhibition. And so from this, uh, a lot of people have concluded about the importance of exhibitions, and Haskell himself says, the impermanence of the art exhibition induces a special excitement, epitomized by the conviction that may never, it may never again be possible to see something that it offers, something from very far away, or from an impenetrable private collection, or a comparison between pictures, the reassembly of a group of them. It may be one's last chance, so one goes. Did anyone see this summer the um, Manet show in, in Venice where they had the Titian Venus of Urbino next to the Manet? No? I know one person saw it, or two people. But anyway, that was, that was a kind of lifetime 
chance, you know, to see this very famous, to see these paintings compared because the normally Titian's painting never leaves its home. Okay, so now, um, wait, we're on the wrong way. So astrocheric force. So astrocheric force is associated with Frege, and this unassorted thoughts, which I was talking about, is associated with Roger's group. And bear in mind, when philosophers are talking about anything, they're never talking about art, well, not never, but rarely about art, rarely about contemporary art, and, and never about exhibitions. So I'm sort of culling these ideas that they have and trying to mold them into how they could, what they could, how they could help us understand what exhibitions do. So none of these artists, or excuse me, none of these philosophers are ever really talking in particular. Well, Scruton's book is Art and Imagination, so he is talking about art. But I don't even think he gives a concrete example of art in the whole book. He just talks about art in general. Okay, so despite the plethora of asserted thoughts in the form of exhibition documents, the exhibition itself remains unasserted. What can be asserted, though, are an impactful exhibition's narrative threads whose sticking power as inserted, excuse me, as institutional memories measure this exhibition's success at conveying its narrative threads. So asserted are just the things that we say. So unasserted things, you know, again, it's these reasons that Mel Candy, Mel Candy talks about reasons, the reasons that we give. When we're giving reasons, we're making assertions. And when we're making assertions, they become public. And when they become public, we have something to discuss. We have to remember, philosophers always try to reduce everything to language. That's not a plus. That's just how they function. So I always try to imagine how we, as the art world, how we do use language. And the way we do use language is what I call this post-exhibition chatter, where we've all seen an exhibition, and we want to chat about what we've seen. So we do, that's when we're using language most. I mean, I don't believe that art is a language. We could have a discussion about that, but I'm not of that view. I think it's non-propositional, and that's actually its strength. Okay, more literally, when terms originate by the curator to grasp particular artworks, later become tools for interpretation, used to conceptualize other artworks, one recognizes the earlier exhibition's impact. It plays a role in the later artworks, their contents, so long as a trail of institutional memories is left behind. Tucker's recalling, well, Marsha Tucker, the curator, is recalling how anti-illusion How anti-illusion procedure materials led to gallery shows and articles offer proof of the curator's role in generating tools that enable others to grasp future artworks. This may be what Arthur Danto meant by artworks conforming to some art world theory, but his view presumes that particular theories are embodied in artworks and are therefore precede each artwork's presentation. I rather propose that the primary purpose of exhibitions is to test hypotheses that lend remember, the word, I purpose to use this word lend because it's not give, it's lend. It's either temporary and something that gets continued or something that disappears. So lends artworks, their appropriate art world theories. When viewers assess an exhibition's narrative threads, they transform unasserted thoughts into asserted statements. Though they occur as a result of experiencing particular artworks together, excuse, or they, sorry, that thoughts that occur as a result of experiencing particular artworks together can be asserted either as propositional attitudes that take the form I think, I believe, I desire, or I know, or common knowledge, which takes the form we know that we know. The beliefs viewers gain as a result of experiencing, experiencing exhibitions have what got the Frege terms esoteric force. That is, they feel true in light of the evidence presented by the exhibition. And you might be interested to know that um, in, let's see what year that was. in 2001, the American Museum Association did a survey, and it turns out that the institutions that Americans trust most are museums. Um, in 2001, a survey sponsored by the AMA concluded, in a skeptical age of information overload, what sources of information do Americans trust most? Is it books, print, and broadcast media? The internet, none of the above. Almost nine out of 10 Americans, 87%, find museums to be one of the most trustworthy or a trustworthy source of information among a wide range of choices. Books are a distant second, and the majority of Americans find print and broadcast media and the internet to not be so trustworthy. Now, I thought a lot about why this could be, and I was thinking, and I think that the reason that they are so 
trusting of museums is because usually you have the curated exhibition and there's always something that pretends to be evidence of clients. But maybe, I don't think they've ever, you know, read on the, read on the survey to figure out why do you trust museums. They're just more interested. Well, they're very proud of the fact that American museums are so trustworthy. But um, I think that, you know, that in itself could be, is maybe a reason for a little skepticism. Okay. All right. So um, here come the problems. So contrary to the supposed merits of talking or writing therapies, whereby the process of actually articulating heretofore unspoken thoughts engenders agency, recent research shows um, that verbalization tends to deform aesthetic experiences, adding undue weight to certain parts while distorting both recollection, recollection and even one's appraisal of said experiences. So just by talking about it, you start to, di no, that's not what I saw, no, that's not what it was like. You know, that's when you start um, really <coughs> wondering whether your memory is so good. But what I think is really interesting is that if you're familiar with this idea of the talking cure or talking therapy, that when you talk about a trauma that you've experienced, talking about it is supposed to give you access to it and agency and help you overcome it. But in fact, Melchioni's using the psychological research that says when it comes to visual experiences, that when we talk about it, in fact, that does the opposite of give us agency. That's when we start to be more skeptical. Although this research into the psychology of taste making, preferences, and deliberation confirms that exhibitions offer people evidence or reasons for their beliefs, it shows that as soon as they attempt to articulate these reasons, the preferences are apt to change. There also seems to be a gap between what one gravitates toward and what one actually finds interesting. So when one begins to explain one's reasons, one realizes that there appear to be better reasons for preferring something else. Even though experiences gleaned from exhibitions challenge long-standing preferences, they simultaneously lead spectators to adopt new ones. I have kind of a stupid example of this, but maybe it might help. So um, it would, both Mark and I used to live in Cincinnati, and the other university where Mark didn't teach at the Art Academy, they had every year an annual contest called the Monumental. We were the judge of the Monumental. So the Monumental contest was all the art students would make really key artworks, and then they'd bring a juror in, and um, the juror would select the top three Monumental artworks, and then they would select the three that they wanted to keep as a prize. There was no money, but, um, you know, as remuneration for your efforts of jury, you got to keep three artworks. And this was a really interesting experience for me because I thought, oh, I'll have this very um, unbiased, I always do try to be unbiased, you know, judge equally for innovation and content and form and execution. But I noticed that the prizes I went to take home were really different than the first, second, and third place I was awarding. So I decided that really, how could I legitimately give someone first, second, and third prize if I wanted to take away something different, right? <laughs> so I took home the first, second, and third in the end. I didn't change my scoring to reflect what I wanted to keep. I just decided to keep what I thought were the best, okay? But I don't know, this may be a little story, but it's something to think about, okay? So, unreliability. Milky Honey's welcome essay in New Prom for Aesthetics indicates that experiences and by extension exhibitions may not actually provide viewers evidence for their inferences as most people, especially philosophers and art educators, think they do. He terms this problem aesthetic and reliability. So basically, I gave you, I, we went through the article first, now I'm sort of coming back to it to see how it applies to exhibitions. Um, he, terms this, he terms this aesthetic unreliability since it concerns the variety of ways in which it's difficult to grasp our aesthetic experience and the consequent confusion and unreliability of what we take as our taste. He offers the example of subjects who like, oh, this is an interesting test. So they had this art school, you could go and get, not art school, maybe a, some school, you could go and get posters. Um, the students that were asked why they chose certain posters, once they had to explain them, they never hung the posters on the wall. But the ones that were never asked, went home and put them on the wall. That somehow in the process of trying to explain what their taste, they even gave up and decided they really didn't like what they had selected. So that sort of ties into what I was telling you about the monumental contest. All right. <clears throat> so I just want to, I want to just have, this is from my footnote in this paper, but I think it's worth reading. 
I described Melchiorni's 2011 essay as welcome precisely because the art world has long recognized this perception, delusion, and introspection as huge problems for aesthetic experience. So this is something the art world knows and the philosophy world still rejects. Still, many philosophers remain committed to neatly conceptualized experiences, inner subjectivity as a given, transparency of the mental, for, and first-person authority, what this other psychologist Eric schwitz gebel terms introspective fallibilism. So there seems to be a huge disconnect, as I've been saying, along between what psychologists think and what philosophers think. All right. Um, Furthermore, whatever comes to mind when we look for reasons has a chance to serve as a reason. As Krista Lawler writes, she's another, she's a philosopher, um, a thought that comes to mind in the course of what one understands to be a search for reasons is taken to be a reason, simply because it occurs in the context of a search for reasons. So when someone says why, and you start to think something, you, just <coughs> you automatically assume that's a good reason, and that is the reason. But what they're all saying is that you should be more skeptical of that. Since curated exhibitions prompt various thoughts, viewers end up searching for reasons both to explain whatever ideas come to mind, as well as to make sense of what are they, whatever they are experiencing at the moment. For example, they might conclude that this particular relate, I call it, I use the term relational cluster to talk about the way artworks are hung together to sort of cause you to infer different things from that hanging. So for example, you might conclude that a particular relational cluster is actually what caused you to generate a particular reason or provides evidence for whatever reasons you've already fabricated, making it impossible for you to specify the problems necessitating explanations in the first place. Since the above mentioned studies indicate that the very process of characterizing one's experience risks distortion, Melkand worries that the search for reasons further distorts our understanding of our prior experiences. In fact, the more complicated reason giving process, the more likely it is to generate confusion and error. So in light of the potential for both aesthetic unreliability and the fallibility of reasons to overwhelm our legitimate reasons, the merit of curated exhibitions seems entirely debilitating. So here's the problem in a nutshell. We make the case that the purpose of an exhibition is so the curator has these hypotheses, here she wants to test, people come to the exhibition, the curator has hang, hung it in a way that you're going to infer particular narrative um, threads, or well, I don't, I'm not going to say the curator is controlling what you think. I'm going to say the curator is working to test his or her hypotheses. You have your own narrative threads. Um, you could come to totally different conclusions, of course, of what's going on, but the question if all of the things that we think whenever we think them are totally unreliable, then what does it, well, how does curating work? I mean, do you, do you understand the problem I'm trying to, um, to generate here? That the curator has this kind of activity that they're trying to, that they're earnestly trying to accomplish, which is to test particular hypotheses, and yet the public is earnestly, becomes confused once they start to infer whatever hypothesis, whatever, narrative threats come to their mind or um, whatever. So the question is, if this is all the case, then curating could be a total fraud, okay? This is a, this is a, this is a skepticism I'm having. I don't believe it's the case, but it could be. If, in fact, um, all of our reasons are suspect and um, what we think and what, how we react doesn't really make a difference. All right, um, okay. So, curated, so here's the question, here's the conclusion, or the, this is the major premise of my paper that you might want to debate, um, or the conclusion of my paper. Curated exhibitions overcome aesthetic unreliability and the fallibility of, fallibility of reasons in at least three ways. First, curators publicly stage exhibitions precisely because people do misremember and inaccurately describe their aesthetic experiences. As shared occasions, rather than personal activities, Spectators freely dispute one another's descriptions and beliefs. So whatever your insights, interpretations, attitudes, and when possible, revisit exhibited artworks or installation photographs to substantiate their madness. <coughs> one could even argue that some critics misdescribing or misremembering prompts a greater public response. In fact, you're more likely 
to discuss a bad review or the review where the critic misunderstood or the review where the, it's, the best is when the critic totally describes the artwork's erroneous. I'm sure you've read the critic said it was this scale, but it was this scale, it was this material, but this material, it was this color, but this color. So you know, I would even argue that the worse the critic does, the more the people are going to be discussing it because in fact the, the, it's quite empowering to, um, to point out the flaws of the critic. Okay, one could even argue that some critics misdescribing or misremembering prompts a greater public response in that reviews that purport erroneous descriptions enliven readers more than reviews with accurate details. Readers happily discredit writers' misrepresentations. Second, curated exhibitions are not meant to be top-down, whereby exhibitions are designed to teach viewers what to think about the artwork's on view, leaving some viewers confused by what they were meant to learn. Curators produce aesthetic experiences that definitely risk the many distortions Melchioni identifies. With this in mind, curators spend a great deal of time anticipating exactly how audiences will respond to each set's members in light of the way they have been selected and positioned. Curators also spend a great deal of time imagining how various arrangements prompt particular audience responses, which generate their own set of narrative threads that double as reasons to believe. So, so the curator's hypothesis can ring true, even if the audience totally misidentifies the curator's hypotheses. Um, okay, in the case of curated exhibitions, public perception matters most. So if the public leaves feeling confused about what they've experienced, and this unfortunately happens a lot, then there will be little to discuss, let alone remember. According to Melchini's claims, the less an exhibition is discussed, the less distortion there is. So speechlessness seems like an advantage. <coughs> Conversely, the narrative threads that curated exhibitions generate must be discussed and remembered in order to have assertory force, let alone develop into institutional memories. This five-step process, which I went over, you know, exhibitions, hypotheses, narratives, institutional memories, five-step process leaves plenty of space for distortions, over-exaggerations, and appraisals to be reappraised as they get molded and formed along the way from exhibition to art history. You have to remember, I, I think of it as like a 20-year process. I don't think of it as like a six-week process or, or a one-year process. I mean, it's really the whole, I mean, I, I could have an entire career as a curator that does 20-year cycles because it seems like what people were thinking about in 93 is what they're going to think about in 2013. It just so happens that for whatever reasons, the young artists of today are always, it's not that they're behind 20 years, but these ideas and art somehow cycle through. So the point being, by the time it becomes art history, it, it takes about at least 20 years. Third and most important, since people are reason shoppers, as Melchiorne claims, only direct experience can counter ill-begotten reasons. It's far easier to feed people erroneous reasons by virtual experiences such as textbooks, lectures, and especially the internet. Those who lack contact with actual artworks are designed to accept as valid reasons posed by others. People who make the most committed anti-art protesters are usually those who haven't experienced whatever works they're protesting. So it seems like it's a lot easier to protest um, Serrano's Piss Christ or Chris Ophelia's uh, The Holy Virgin Mary or last year's um, inflammatory anti-Islam film if in fact you haven't seen it. If you've seen it, then you start to change your mind about it. Like I hardly have ever met anyone who has seen The Piss Christ and is really offended by it. Okay, so the act of dismissing artworks that one has experienced firsthand proves emancipating, whereas the act of inciting misinformed protesters infantilizes them exploits their feelings of victimhood, and serves to intensify their sense of hopelessness. That said, curatorial care entails remaining sensitive to viewers' varying levels of experience and expectations while warning them in advance about potentially offensive artworks. Given the public's ex public exhibition's role in opening up discussions rather than closing them down, discussing an exhibition's narrative threads actually helps to reduce distortions. Other viewers' assertions about the exhibition prove additional evidence, helping one to discern whether one's dispositions are justified or not, enabling one to adjust them accordingly. Shared beliefs, those that are asserted and widely discussed, that hold up in light of the evidence, eventually generate second-order knowledge. We know that we know whatever.
about the exhibition's content and its most appropriate method of conceptual and its appropriate method of conceptualization. What I have in mind here is not the public's reaction to the exhibition, whether they fancy the exhibition or not, but beliefs that cause spectators to revise or expand their reasons for appreciating or dismissing artworks. Only objects situated in never, ex never changing exhibitions, such as galleries designated pre-Columbian art, medieval art, African art, impressionism, engender experiences that are real and not imagined, since viewers can return time and time again to refresh their memories and check the evidence. By contrast, temporary exhibitions that last at most a few months engender institutional memories that begin as beliefs caused by public discussions about narrative threads embodied in the exhibition. Institutional memories are effectively some consensus or summary of the set of shared beliefs underlying the common knowledge that survives as art history. So that's the talk. Thank you. Conversation that starts to roll. I don't know, is that clarifying? 
I mean, I don't, the curators, to me, their great joy is getting to do the show. Not, you know, anything more than that, but maybe I'm wrong on that. Go ahead. Hey there. Um, I've got a question about your presentation today. Um, okay. <laughs> and is it too confusing? Is it just as confusing as Melchione's? No. no. Um, what I wanted to ask about was, um, it seems that on the one hand, some of the virtues that you were talking about throughout the whole presentation about exhibition making, around kind of um, temporality, um, different forms of experience, and then also in the way that you kind of situate ideas of the public around exhibition making. On the one hand you have this, but then on the other hand you have the kind of language from which the presentation is made from. So there's these like, different forms of theory, different forms of, of analysis, kind of facts and um, facts that have come from different forms of uh, specific types of research. So I was wondering what the relationship is. And in some ways I kind of, I don't understand that for me there seems to be a contradiction between some of the virtues that you're talking about in terms of experience and exhibitions and exhibition making, then the kinds of language okay. that you, they've used today and that your presentation is made from. So in some ways I kind of don't really understand maybe your desire for, for the language that you use today in terms of what you're saying about exhibition making. That's a, I think that's a totally valid and great point. Um, the, you have, the only way I can explain this is that you know, the, the training and philosophy that I come from is sort of like you have to say true things about things. And maybe there's some of you who don't believe it's possible to say anything true about anything. And I can understand that as well. Um, and every true statement is probably later disproven as well. But at this point, I'm just trying to say what can we say about exhibitions in the way that they function in the way that, um, and be a little skeptical at the same time. Not just like not just give you the five steps of, of an exhibition's life and how it goes from an exhibition to can formation and it always works like that and it's not messy and there's not problems along the way. So, <coughs> so instead of just giving you this sort of like, this is how it is, I'm trying to disrupt it a little by showing just the real problems with, um, some of the assumptions that underlie exhibitions in the first place. But I, I think it's true that I'm using like, language that's, that's not at all ethereal. That's more about trying to make a statement about things and trying to understand what it is your exhibitions do. But um, the program I came from, you can't be the least bit poetic about anything. <laughs> I mean, every single program is it? Well, it was a, a really classic analytic philosophy program. With a lot, I mean, with a lot of phenomenology mixed in, but I don't think anyone's doing phenomenology PhDs at Temple. So, but maybe I'm lucky. I can balance this side of my life with my more creative, poetic, curatorial side. I don't know. Did you see Green Acres, Mark? No. No. Because I was, because you might be able to argue that Green Acres is really different than this, or Green. Acres or the way I curate is more the same. I don't know. Go ahead. Um, I was thinking about that problematics or difference of agency uh, given by speech and analysis and, and experiencing exhibitions. I, I was actually thinking about it all the way through when, when you were talking about how talking kind of uh, deconstructs space. And I was thinking, yeah, but it's like the like talking about uh, traumatic experiences and, and analysis and so there are two problems that to me seem to kind of converge um, the first is that taste is not reliable like as, as you were talking but then that speech will deconstruct taste and isn't it what actually will uh, relate to the experience of the exhibition I mean isn't that great? Well, I mean, and I know that's my feeling. Like, yeah, I think it's even a reason why people don't like to read the didactic panels in museums, right? Because they're really afraid that they'll read something and that whatever that they read will challenge what they feel, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, 
I don't know her name, but she brought up the point that she was thinking that even before I brought up the, the distinction between the um, talking cure, where the, the, by talking you get access to your feelings, and you can usually work through, you can process them by having access to them, and how with exhibitions, the more you talk about, the more we get confused. Instead of getting access to something, we tend to get confused. Um, and she says, isn't it great? I'm not really sure why you think it's great, though. But why, is, why, is, why, is, why do you make that difference that deconstruction gives? I didn't I use mean, the word deconstruction. Was you I use deconstruction. Yeah. But this, you, you say it's confusion, but why isn't it in the same way deconstruction of something you're giving, like when you do self-analysis? You're analyzing a situation, you talk about it, you deconstruct it. Why does that have to be? Well, in the original case the of the confused? talking cure, you're not deconstructing something so much as you're getting access to something that's been repressed. Like before you had a term, you have, you know, in the, in the normal case of the talking cure, you haven't had access to this information. So then by talking about it and remembering it, you gain access to it, and you can remember some... And is that not similar when you talk about a show? You talk about, you have a conversation, you get access to thoughts that you might have not had before the... Oh, totally. That's, yeah. what I said. That's what I wanted to say. But yes. why is the confusion? No, it's initially confusion, but what I try to work out in the end is that because it's public and because we... It's only confusion when you're talking about it with yourself, but when you start to talk about it with other people, and that's when the confusion gets minimized because someone says, oh no, they were doing this and they were doing that. The, confu okay, the confusion that Mel Candy talks about is not a confusion that people have when discussing things with themselves or amongst themselves. It's a confusion that they have when they're only talking about their own personal preferences. <coughs> and I try to say that what exhibitions offer is that they make this public, and it's a public discussion. It's not just simply a personal reflection. That's all I'm saying. I'm saying that the way we overcome a lot of the confusion is that we make it more public, and not just simply, you know, in the case of the poster, the person who is asked why they like their poster, or why they, why they chose a poster, and then gets confused, that's just one person. He's not in a, he or she's not in a room with 12 other people discussing the poster and then actually maybe coming to the conclusion that he selected the best poster and he should put it up, right? So all the confusions that are discussed with seem to, discussed seem to be people only being asked to give, only discuss things by themselves, not in a public arena. Whereas exhibitions that are shared are public, people have divergent experiences, but then they come together at cocktail parties or I don't know how, we're all, I mean, it seems like all I do is talk about art. So in all my spare time and all I'm doing is talking about art, I'm publicly sharing my views and listening to what other people have to say. So I guess, yeah, it's, it is great. But it wouldn't be that way if, if only one of you went on one studio visit to one friend's studio, and then you would have your views and I'd say, well, why did you like that? and you would tell me, and you might be confused, but I wouldn't be able to help you. Or I wouldn't be able to, not help you, but give you another view that would either clarify your ideas or confuse you even, even more. So, okay, go ahead. I have the similar problem with the presentation. I feel that I really like the subject matter and I really like to see your experience of creating an exhibition rather than a synchromatic paper Oh, well, I was, I, I'm happy to come back and talk again about my curating, but I wasn't asked to do that, so. <laughs> and I mean, I mean, the knowledge of you think can also come through. Well, you know, that's interesting. That, okay, let's, let me just back up. So, one of, every, um, every curator's, every book out there on curating is simply a story about what curators have done in the past, right? They don't only talk about themselves, they talk about their own exhibitions, they talk about what they learned from exhibitions, what they were trying to do. That's the material that exists. No one has tried to, not no one, but no one that I know of, has tried to create a more global view that they hope that could be applied to lots of different projects. So I guess that's what, um, I, I try to avoid a first-hand account of, all, of my experience. I don't know why, but because I wanted to create a more, to try to really think if I could, if it, is it possible to generalize what exhibitions do? as opposed to um, talk about any of my exhibitions or... Um, but anyway, in this particular case, you didn't ask me to talk about curating or my exhibitions. And so I didn't do that. But in fact, 
um, in the project, in the book itself, the, or the dissertation, I really didn't talk about myself at all in the whole book. Because it, I, know, I was trying to make it more global. I mean, it seems to me that if that um, now there's this burgeoning field called the philosophy of museums, not because of me, it's been going on for the last three years, and we're having annual conferences. And in fact, um, it's very difficult to even understand what museums are, what they do, how they function, and it ha and we're trying to come up with all the the language and the terms and um, try to characterize it. So in fact, you know, this is a working model, like I said at the very beginning of the talk, and hopefully it'll be modified over the years before it gets published. But um, I'm sure it would be more interesting to hear about my exhibitions than my ideas. But I don't know what. Any more? You started, or you mentioned before that your term of curator includes artists arranging the work, but it seems to me it's drifted more and more to the profession of a curator that is curating a show in a museum or an institution. In I don't know that because every artist I ever know thinks a lot about where they place things and how they. Very much so, but do we. I think a lot of us don't call themselves curators in such a way that you care about your work. Yes, in the kind of well, you're cur when you're selecting the works that you're going to exhibit and you're thinking about how your audience is going to experience their exhibition, that's curating. I don't know why. I think that actually. I think you're right in that, but I'm just saying by addressing people in this room who are artists as curators, it might not reach them in the same way. Simply. Well, I also think on the flip of that, when collect when people just select things that they like, I don't think that's curating. So you know, I I talk a lot about the difference between a curated exhibition and an uncurated exhibition. Uh, curated, there's a lot of uncurated museums. There's a lot of collections that like a lot of people have used the wonder cabinet as a model for curating. That's collecting to me, not curating, because in fact it's just bringing together things that you think are interesting and, cur and curious, but curating isn't like that. Curating is trying to have a hypothesis that you want to test. And even when you're an artist and you're thinking about your next show, you're thinking about, okay, over the last three years I made 48 things, I can only show 12, I want to make a consistent body of work, I want to convey this project that I've been thinking about, I want to see people's reactions. So I'm just saying for me, Artists may not call themselves curating, but that's a very important part of, of being an artist, and especially a young artist, you know, when you're, when you're not working with someone who you might be collaborating with on an exhibition. I only meant that the use of term does something to people who listen to it. I'm fully aware of that that's part of our practice. It, what does it do? Tell me what it does. It makes them anger? I, I've heard that artists hate curators, but that's not my problem. I don't do, <laughs> you know, I think that's crazy man, in the sense that, like, first of all, curators who don't think what they do is collaborative are assholes. And artists who hate curators, I don't know you, I don't learn how to work with curators. Not because, I don't have a view that curators are the gatekeepers. For me, the spectators are the gatekeepers. Um, and so the curator can help you, if you're not curating your own show, Hopefully the curator is helping you to see things in your work that you have overlooked and that you would like to um, amp up. You know, hopefully the curator is working with you to help you make a better exhibition. Not that the curator is organizing the exhibition and saying, come over when it's hung. That's a bad curator, in my mind. Okay, what did you want to say with that? I think there was something over there. Well, I think in the, in the case of students during the student evaluation after college, 
they had totally different, it's not that they weren't close enough to the situation, they had totally different values. So instead of this teacher gave a really hard midterm and they're trying to flunk me, they maybe were able to take away something from the class that mattered to them more than just simply a grade or, yeah, I don't know the answer. It's just that some universities do the student evaluations after. I mean, the vast majority do them during. Um, anyway. Well, I don't think they use artists. They better be working with artists. It's not my opinion. I, I don't know how else to even describe what exhibitions are then. Yes, it's my view. I wouldn't call it my opinion, but it's my theory that um, what exhibitions are are hypotheses that are being tested in the public. Just the way in um, the way scientists test, use, um, publish. It's like a peer review. But, but it's the, the Okay. Okay. So she wants to know what my opinions are on the power dynamics between curators and art, artists, as well as the perception of the public. And sorry, the, the, the perceptions of the artwork or the artists okay. making artworks for that exhibition to test Oh, 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 oh. Well, I don't think artworks should artists should ever make artworks for exhibitions. That wouldn't be testing any hypotheses. That would be, I don't even know. That would be working for the curator. I mean. Curators who are testing hypotheses are usually working with extant works. Or they're working, or they might say to the artist, oh, I'm doing a show about this and your work would fit, and the artist says, I want to make a new work. But you're not going to say, oh, let's do a show about farming, and you're going to have someone who's never done any farming. You can be my show if you start farming. You know, that wouldn't make any sense. So I, you're right. If, if, the way the, okay, if the way the curator works is that they simply say, I have a theme, I don't know, Madonna and Child. You want to make a piece for my Madonna and Child show? They're not testing any hypotheses. I don't know what that is. That's not curating to me. That's just simply a thematic exhibition for the fun of an exhibition. I don't really know. That to me doesn't sound like curating. That sounds like organizing an exhibition. But when the curi I'm not really a big fan of curators. I'm in fan. I'm hugely in favor of curators getting their themes from artists, not from curators inventing the theme and then going out and finding artists who are desperate to be in a show and make artworks for that curator's um, uh, dream project or something like that. But no, commission work is different, but commissions have to come from the artist. Do you know what I mean? You don't, I don't know of curators who commission an artist to make something that they never thought about making in their life. You know, you say to the artist, um, I mean, in my farming show, I had money to, do, to commission six works. The only people in my farming show were people who had done farming as art before. They weren't even people that had kitchen gardens. It wasn't just like, oh, you have a kitchen garden, maybe you want to be a farmer artist. No, they had to be people that had been exhibiting farming as artworks in the context of the art world. Then I got money to do shows or to do commissions, and I said, hey, I can give you $6,000. What would you like to do? And it's totally up to them. So it's a commissioned artwork, but I'm not the one coming up with a theme of how they're going to spend the money. You know, I want you to do a project based on soil. Uh, I don't have anything in my show about soil. Why don't you do something on soil? That would, to me, that's really overstepping the role of the curator. Maybe, I'm sure there are people here that disagree. I've had lots of disagreements. But um, I, really, I also believe that exhibitions are co-authored. I mean, I'm not talking about this in this context, but you know, an exhibition is you know, there's non-art experts that are involved, there's art experts that are involved, there's artists that are involved. There's all these people involved in exhibition. It's not just simply a curator and artworks and a public. You know, you even have the space to get the space is a participant, the um, community is a participant. You have lots of factors playing. Okay, good, we're getting a really good debate. Okay, up there and then over there. Okay. I have a question about the hypothesis testing all the possible. In scientific context, uh, there, there is an obligation to, to test the hypothesis all the time. 
mm -hmm. the results should be feasible. Okay. Uh, whereas you have stressed the, um, the normal feasible experience of the art exhibition. And also, um, the criteria for disproving the hypothesis have to be committed to before the test is actually undertaken if it's a scientist and a scientific test. Whereas you, I think, imply that, um, that they are open. The, the, the exhibition and its consequences <coughs> have an open-ended process whereby the significance of the results can be re reviewed post-hoc and perhaps completely renegotiated. You might wonder how you, whether you consider some of those, or, 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 or are you taking hypothesis testing as a kind of metaphor? Uh, I don't really mean it as a metaphor. Um, I think that what I'm interested in is the ones that stick and the ones that don't stick. The, I mean, the institutional memories that stick and then become common knowledge. So to me, those are ones that aren't so ad hoc. Do you know what I mean? Like, for example, um, everyone, all the time, they're revising when does abs when is the, whose is the first abstract painting, right? Some people can't see 1914. Some people will look, say, no, no, that's not true. Look at this John Singer Sargent. You can see this is an abstract painting. So those are the kinds of things I have in mind. Um, if you wanted to prove that, after, after, let's say someone has a theory that um, all these views that abstract painting is a 20th century phenomenon are really wrong, that in fact, look at all these 19th century paintings. I mean, there's actually some really great Seurats that are really abstract. So you could do like a 19th century abstract painting show. So then it would now be true, because you've shown the evidence that these people were all doing abstract painting in the 19th century. We didn't call it abstract painting. We didn't have the language or the, the where, we didn't have the capacity to recognize it as abstract painting. But then it would be very difficult to go back and say, at Kandinsky is the first abstract painter, once all that is, in, in play. That's the point. That's the kind of way I have it. So it's not metaphorical, but it's um, everyone would have to readjust their views. Our history, though our history books would have to be rewritten. Does that make sense? I, I mean, I, so, and I think this goes on a lot more than we know. Okay. You go there. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just trying to position what is actually coming across, like a kind of a lack of a position in a way. Yeah. Um, can you give us an example of a curator who's put out a book hypothesis um, and the results of that, that test? Sure. Okay. Um, I don't see. Okay, the exhibition right now at the Tate Modern, or excuse me, Tate Britain is an example of this. Has anyone seen this art under attack? What's the yeah yeah? What's the hypothesis and the how hypothesis can you possibly know that it's been proven and to whom and by whom? Sorry. Well, if it uh, okay, well this is a good point because in my mind this exhibition, the first part of it is really enlightening and really holds up, but the last part doesn't hold up. So, if if, if all of you start to rethink your attitudes about the way, okay. So if you haven't seen the show, it's like a five-part show. It talks about religious icons that have been like during the Reformation when Henry VIII decides to become an a, a Anglican. I'm the head of the Church of England, and he's resting power from Rome. Just people react in his favor and start to disfigure Catholic icons. Okay, so then it goes from there. It goes to political people taking down political opponents, and it goes down to the suffragettes attacking artworks in the museums, and it goes to contemporary artworks that have been attacked in museums, and then it goes to artwork artists who attack their own artworks. So um, when you say who is it being proven to? So one, one of the things that occurred to me when I saw the show is how, um, how kind of bold it is to do a show like this because in a weird way you're encouraging the public to attack, public, to attack artworks, right? Or you're legitimizing the, um, you're on one hand legitimizing the destruction of, of public property and on the other hand you're asking people not to demonize people only because they have destroyed public property, that there might be legitimate reasons. So if you yourself start to stop, if you don't think that only crazy people you know, just are vandals, then in a weird way that show to me will have made its point. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. 
Yes, but it do, you're not answering the question. The question is, what is the hypothesis and how is it that you, for example, as the speaker to us today, claiming that you somehow can judge whether the hypothesis is successful? To whom is it successful and how is that judged and what is the hypothesis? You haven't answered that question. Okay, the hypothesis is, our in Britain has been under attack since, whatever, 1588 or something like that. And here are the, here are five ways that art has been under attack. It's not, they don't bring up the um, statues in, in Afghanistan, but the implication is that whenever people um, destroy things because of religious purposes, we have been doing this in England for 600 years. You know, and, and, it, and it takes its different turns at every different moment. We've, we've taken um, this one duke down, we've taken this, I'm just saying, that's the hypothesis. The hypothesis is that Art under attack is not unique to um, disgruntled citizens in faraway places. That we have our own history of behaving this way. So that's the premise. Has it been proven? It ha won't be proven until after the show. I mean, the proof is whether or not you think that maybe you could argue that in fact there's not enough cases. That these are 15 isolated cases and um, it's not enough to show that it's a normal or believable way that English people behave. Uh, okay. I, I have just—it's just a yes/no question. Are you only interested in curating as a way for testing a hypothesis about art? Well, I wouldn't say that's just—it's just, it's just a very what I'm only question. interested in. But what other kinds of curating do you have in mind? I don't know. I think the things that are other than art. <laughs> that it's—it's it's it's just a, I don't know. Oh, you mean curating things other than art? No, I. It's a very straightforward question. Is are your is your hypothesis in I mean I don't think that's the correct word, but are you only interested in curating as suggesting a hypothesis, a hypothesis that is about art or the art world or art history? No. Okay. No. No. I don't, I don't think that's what she's saying though. No, no, she's just asking the question. Okay. But I mean just for the sake of I'm not trying to be uh, polemic necessarily, but I think that it's just you're kind of drawing a parallel. I think it's a lot of people are seeming to get really caught up in that as the, it's like, could, I mean, you're saying hypothesis, yes, but it doesn't seem to me that that's like, it has to, okay, what is this, and this, and this yeah. part of the scientific method. Well, like, the, the thing is, is that exhibitions, I mean, you can have fun exhibitions that are, um, you know, if, like, I oh, sorry. When I've worked with my curating students, and they they don't really, they haven't really, um, they don't really have any major hypotheses to test, whatever. Sometimes they just are like, uh, the first show I always do with them is just say, choose your three best friends. And let's just do a show where you have, not your three best friends, your three favorite artists. Not your three best friends, your three favorite artists. <laughs> <laughs> and that to me is already good enough, right? Because that's a hypothesis. My hypothesis is these are the three best artists I know. And sometimes those curating students will call some really famous artists, and I'm really surprised that I'm in Sue Spade's curating class, and I want you to be my show, okay, whatever. And sometimes they just deal with really unusual artists that I would have never even had access to, other than my young curating students and who they are. So the point is, is that a hypothesis doesn't have to be that grand. You know, it could be, um, this is my best work I did this year, and I'm trying to test it, or, um, but the point is, is that otherwise I wouldn't, it would be very difficult for me to understand how you would know even how to make your checklist and arrange the work if you didn't have something in mind that you were trying to um, explore. And to me, it's more interesting to say it's a hypothesis than it's like expression. Because in fact, like I, I think a lot of times people say, oh, art is expression, and I'm really not in favor. I think art is discovery. So to me, because I believe that art is discovery, the notion of hypothesis is more coherent with a position that when we're when people are artists, they are challenging themselves all the time. They're using new materials they never used. They're um, trying different scales they've never tried. They're trying different concepts that they've never tried. They're always more in a discovery mode than they are in an expression mode. I mean, if you really, so the hypothesis testing sort of goes along with um, this role of artists as discoverers more than, um, essayist was something to communicate. I don't know. Maybe the hypothesis where it sounds too grand. But the word test is problematic because it means fail or winning. Well, that's and what I, I mean. Well, that's like, for us artists, I don't think we, we would be happy with making oh. art, putting it out 
other see it's failing or if it's winning. We're not looking for any winning or failing. Well, I don't think the opposite, in this context, the opposite of failure isn't winning. The opposite of failure is just um, even acknowledgement. It's not just the word hypothesis, it's the, the language that you use in your uh, writing, but also in the presentation, which is that you know, see those algebraic, see those logical. And what it does is it reduces it to, um, it uses an opinion as fact. that Tate Modern did, I don't know, five years ago, six years ago, open systems. They were arguing that everything in that exhibition was an open system. I mean, in fact, that's how Tate Modern hangs every one of its gallery shows. Dreams and, what's the one they have now? Dreams and poetics. Like that. What? Nothing. <laughs> well, I'm just Maybe saying that, that the Tate Modern is not necessarily a kind of radical or anything other than an ultimately entirely liberal way of understanding curating art and the public. Like, maybe that's not the model of curation that we're looking for. Maybe, th maybe that's... Or maybe there is a, no such thing as a model of curating as well. Yeah. Like... Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, okay, here's, here's something that we could spend the next four years debating. Uh, I have friends who want to say all curators are artists and all artists are curators, and they don't really want to um, make a distinction. And it's for me, it's really important to make a distinction between when the artist is acting as a curator and when the curator is acting as an artist. And um, I, I want to say that they're really different projects. They're not two sides of the same coin. Um, maybe the very best artists are excellent curators, but, but in their art making process, as artists, they're making artists as exhibition makers, they're doing something very different than when they're making art. And I would hope that when people are making art, they're not as conscious as when they're making exhibitions. And I would hope that when curators are making exhibitions, they're, they're not as free-formed, as, you know, as open-ended as, um, I don't know. Why? 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 I mean, why, why does would a curatorial project need to be more uh, need to be less open-ended than an artist project. Like, what's the dis like? You're making these radical okay, distinctions. Okay, all right, all right. Lovely open. Point. What does that even mean? I mean, it's just this romantic ideal. So, I think at the end of the day, all curating is open-ended because you can't, like I say over and over, you can't force people to come up with certain ideas. You can't force people to have any kind of particular. Um, reaction or response or understanding of the work. You can't force anything. But you at the same time have to attempt to do that. Because you don't have to, but in my view, it seems like you would want to attempt to do something. I don't really understand curating that's simply gathering. Uh, otherwise, it's taste making. That's my worry. My worry is that um, curating is just effectively, these are the things I like. These are the things that matter to me. These are the works my friends have made. I mean, I don't think curating should be about friends. <clears throat> I think it's, I mean, maybe as a starting point, but I, I think it has to be a, a bigger position than just simply, um, and in fact, you know, this is something that, that I do all the time. I include artworks that I don't particularly like, and I include artworks by people I don't necessarily like. That's not very true because there's not many people I don't like, but I'm just saying, I'm not going to be just like, Oh, that's a really great artwork, but that person's a real pain to work with. And they'd be like, no, it has to be in the show. If it's not in the show, it's a whole. And that's what I'm trying to say. To me, a curated exhibition, if it, it, it can be missing particular artworks. And with, when it's missing the particular artworks, then the people don't get their inferences that they need to get. So, can I ask you why you uh, chose certain artworks that, uh, in, in that competition, but you wanted to take another artwork? Um, Wait, what did you say? That there was a competition where you had, you had oh, the monumental, yeah. Well, I think that when I went just by what I liked, I liked things that weren't as strong as when I tried to judge them more. Um, what's the word? Um, 
try in my system of trying to be of awarding points for a more for like innovation and content and form, you know, for awarding points for things that weren't just simply my gut reaction. So I don't know how to say that. But you know, maybe. If you would, if you would like to come uh, and continue talking, will you come to the pub, please? <laughs>